I have an overwhelming desire to call you all grandma. Uh, not because uh, 31 years ago, St. Winifred's School Choir said there's no one quite like grandma. Um, although I think if you're working in the arts today, there really is no one quite like it. It's tough out there. But because over the next 20 minutes, I am going to show you a metaphorical egg and tell you how to suck it. The amount of knowledge and skill and expertise that is already in this room vastly exceeds mine. Um, and I, I only stand here fairly humbly. Fortunately, I'm only speaking for about 20 minutes, so I won't take up much of your time. Uh, and I've been asked to talk about making the ask and donor care. And if, there was, uh, if this slot was going to last 30 seconds, this is the only slide I would show you that really the bottom line is about being nice to people. It really is, bluntly speaking, not much more complex than being nice to people. Um, easy to say, but not always so easy to do. Has anyone ever heard of this man? Alberto Villar? Yes, yes thank you, a few names, excellent. Um, Alberto Villar made an enormous amount of money by investing in Microsoft uh, sometime before it really took off. And Alberto loves opera. Absolutely loves it and became a huge philanthropist. Uh, the Grand Circle at the Met was named after him, and the Floral Hall at our very own uh, Covent Garden was named after him, the Villar Floral Hall. He got a lot of stick for wanting his name associated with it. Um, but he said, the only way we're going to encourage other philanthropists is if I stand up and be proud. And I think time has possibly shown him to be right. There was a problem, however, for Alberto. Um, his shares went down <laughs> as his passion for philanthropy went up. And um, unfortunately, although he promised large sums of money to many arts organizations, he started to find it rather difficult to deliver and started to borrow some funds from his clients and is now in prison. Um, <clears throat> so whatever you do, don't encourage your philanthropist to become addicted to it as, as Alberto is. But it's an interesting question because the Opera House has now taken his name off it and have uh, renamed it the, the Hamlin Floral Hall. He had a bad time. At what point should the Opera House have stood by him? At this very moment, we have an issue of BP and the Tate. Um, if it's about being nice to people, when do you stand by them when they're having a bad time? When do, you stand by, when do they stand by you when you're having a bad time? It's about the nature of that relationship. Um, and that is the central point, I think, to, to both making the ask and good donor care. Um, both of which, ultimately, I would argue, come down to donor motivation. What on earth has persuaded someone to hand some of their hard-earned money over to you. Why do they want to give you that cash? Understand that motivation, and I think both donor care um, and indeed the ask naturally follow through uh, from that knowledge. Uh, when uh, I was looking into all of this, I, I found various uh, reports about what inspires us or what, what filters our desire to give money. Um, and apparently, according to psychologists, there are four things that go through our brains when someone asks us to give money. The first one is the extrinsic factors. Who are they? Who are they? Their, their age, their gender, um, their religion. The next ones are the intrinsic factors. What do they think about? Amongst those is guilt, which is a thing the vast majority of the charity sector whack with a massive great hammer to get people to give them money. Um, when I was at the Young Vic, the uh, Amnesty were running a campaign with, frankly, a picture of a dead seal on an envelope and, and a banner headline that Morsi said, you've done this by not giving us money. Um, and I wanted to produce a similar envelope at the Young Vic with a whole bunch of out-of-work actors on the cover and say, you've done this by not giving us money. I don't think it would have worked. Guilt is an incredibly hard trigger for the arts to use. The next one, though, is what links them to the cause, the fit with self, which is, I think, the key area that the arts do use. The vast majority of people who are going to give you money have already walked through your doors. It's not as if there's some world out there of rich people who've never heard you've existed who's suddenly going to throw money at you. Your donors already know you. And that is where the fit with self becomes very important. And then finally, the ask. How are they asked? Which we'll come back to in a second. Um, extrinsic factors. Who do you think gives more money, the young or the old? Thank you. The old. Excellent. Um, and you're right. Um, but I think there's another important thing that's happening here. We are seeing the end of patrician philanthropy. We're seeing the end of the time which people will give you money because they love you to bits, and they trust you to bits to go off and spend the money appropriately. The younger want to know what you're going to do with the cash. What difference is it going to make if they give you the money, as indeed opposed to someone else uh, to whom they could give the money? And that, 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 that nature of that relationship and that nature of that conversation is, I think, becoming much more acute. It's very much around um, uh, crowdfunding. Uh, who gives more, men or women? 
Women always say that very loudly. Men never stand up for themselves. It's, um, and, and actually, the women are right. Um, but there's another important difference. Women tend to give smaller sums to more charities. Men tend to like to give one big check to a thing, and, and there's a whole psychology and that which we won't go into. Um, <laughs> but the important thing is, if you're approaching a couple and you're doing a big capital campaign, who do you smile at first, the man or the woman? If you're producing a friend's leaflet, what is the type of person it's aimed at, the man or the woman? These are grand, generaliza grand generalizations, but I'm trying to get you to understand it's not just one blank world out there. Uh, who gives more, the poor or the rich? <laughs> oh, thank you, whoever said rich. Um, sort of, for both. The poor tend to give a bigger percentage of their wealth. The rich give more money, um, which is good because the arts tend to approach, uh, uh, attract the rich. But there's another important difference. The poor tend to give to need. This child is starving, please give us money, and we can feed the child. The rich tend to prefer solutions. This child is starving, so please buy the child a goat. Because with the goat, it can milk it and sell it and do whatever else it can do with the goat. Which is an interesting thing. If, if the demographic you're largely approaching are the wealthier end of society, are you talking about need, or are you asking about solutions? Are you presenting them with a solution, particularly at this time in which there's a lot of problems going on? Are you going to a donor saying, we're running out of money, help, we need money? Or are you going to go to a donor saying, we've lost our Arts Council funding, but this is giving us a new lease of life. This is enabling us to come up with sustainable solutions. This is the solution we want to deliver. Can you play a part in that? Need versus solution. Um, and psychologists also tell us that there are actually four different ways in which we think about money. The first is the cash in the pocket. If, if, well, there is a donation box outside of here, and if you're minded to give to the glorious Imperial War Museum as you're leaving, you'll put your hand in your pocket, you'll pull out whatever change, and you'll put something in. If you have four 20p pieces, you might put in two 20p pieces. If you have four one pound coins, you might put in a pound coin. A huge difference in the amount of money you have given based on the entire random nature of what is in your pocket. It's very quick, though. What you probably won't do is rush home and set up a direct debit. The job is done, the donation is given, even if the amount of money given is fairly small. Um, next up is the amount of money that we have in our wages after tax, then the amount of money before tax that we think we earn each year, and then finally the total assets. As you go down this, obviously the sums of money get bigger, but the time needed to make a decision gets longer. Which is why in, in most retail outlets, what they do is they don't say this is a 120 pound washing machine coming into annual wages. This is a washing machine you can have for 10 pounds a month for 12 months, taking it up into monthly wages. Uh, my partner is a costume maker for a children's theater. She's not very rich. She's given 500 quid to uh, a heritage organization in the southeast of England. Um, now they asked her for a fiver a month. And she thought, I could do that. Most arts organizations tend to ask for all the money up front. The wider charity sector has been a lot more astute at trying to get the ask up this line to get people to say yes quicker, asking for a smaller amount of money over a repeated period. And it worked for my partner, and I think it, it, the arts are missing a trick here and should think laterally about how they do that ask in order to ensure that everyone who can afford does give. So, that's why people support charities in general. Why do I think they support the arts? I think there is a glorious, glorious, fabulous, love them to bits group of people who give money because they care about the arts happening and they want to support it. Then there's a group of people who give because they want the benefits. They want the tickets. They want their name. They want something. And then finally, I would argue there's a group of people who actually do it to be seen to be doing it. I know from the Almeida, I'd see people look at the board, look at the other names up there and go, I should be up there. The interesting thing here is I think there's a certain amount of schizophrenia out there about where people think they are and where they actually are. Um, I'll give you an example. I am uh, I'm a huge fan of an American artist called Edward Gorey. And they, when he died, they've turned his house into a museum. And I was on some mailing list, so I got a letter saying, would you be, give some money so we can turn his house into a museum? The house is in Cape Cod. I'm never going to go. I'm not going to use the shop discounts. I am absolutely in to enable the arts to happen. Gave my money. They then sent out their first newsletter, badly photocopied. Inside the front cover, they listed the founding donors of the Edward Gorey House. And there was my name. And I was so chuffed I wrote another check. Because um, there was my name amongst a whole bunch of other names. I thought I was up there. They probably thought I was up there. But actually, I was in, part of me was in developed social standing. 
And I think it's a really interesting exercise to plot where your donors think they are and where they actually are in order to understand how you develop your relationship with them. A lot of people, a lot of people in the arts think that donors give just for the benefits and then find out that actually most of the donors don't take up the benefits. <coughs> where are they and where do they think they are? The final one, to, final circle to put up here, slightly potentially uh, controversial, is to make a profit. Um, let's assume you're an arts organization and you're going to build a cafe because you think you're going to make money from the cafe. And there's an entrepreneur in the town and you go to her and you say, we're doing a big capital campaign, can we have some money? She may or may not give. Instead, you go to her and you say, we're an arts organization, we want to become sustainable, so we're going to create this cafe, a retail space that if we get it right, will make money. We would like you to invest in this. If we make the money, you get your money back. But it's more than your money that we want. We want your brain. You're an incredibly successful entrepreneur. We want you to help us make this a success. That's called venture philanthropy. I think mainly most donors, if they get involved in this, they don't want the money back because they become so excited. But in terms of the nature of the ask, you're appealing to their brain, not their wallet. And it's through their brain that they filled their wallet, and they're going to appreciate that much better than the simple need for cash. OK, um, this is the Courthill Institute, just down the road. A few years ago, I sent a um, student around London uh, to look at how arts organizations raise money. It's a fascinating thing to do. Give yourself half a day, wander around how other arts organizations are doing it. You'll see great work, you'll see less great work. Uh, the student went to the Courthill Institute, and she went up to the volunteer desk, volunteer there sitting there, and she said, I'd like to give some money to the Courthill. How do I do that? And apparently the woman looked at her and said, I don't think we take money, dear. <laughs> but if you want, you might talk to the man over there. So she went to the man over there, and he eventually found a, a photocopied piece of paper asking for donations of up to £1,000. They have a great fundraising team at the Courthill. This was before the current team. All let down by the volunteer today. Um, uh, when I was at the Almeida, I, um, I ran a focus group on our donors. And the same people, frankly, in London give to the Almeida, give to the National, give to wherever. We were having this focus group. And someone mentioned something at the National Theatre. The National Theatre, I don't know if they still do it, at that point had something called celebrities. You got a cup of tea, a scone, and Judy Dench. It was lovely. <laughs> and someone in our focus group said, you know those celebrities at the National? Yeah. Those scones, they're always stale. And oh my God, it opened floodgate. They all started talking about the stale scones at the National Theatre. These were the things that were irking them about the National. And I wouldn't be surprised if some people stopped giving because of the stale scones. <laughs> so the, 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 my first question to you is, where are your stale scones? <laughs> what is it that you're doing that's upsetting people? It could be an uncomfortable seat. It could be the fact that you don't have a coat rack. What is irking them about your organisation? You need to know what that is because it's stopping people. Um, a few years ago, we sent, unsolicited, 20 checks of 50 quid each to a group of museums in the West Midlands. This was part of something we were doing with the MLA. This is how they responded. 20% wrote a thank you letter within the first week, which is absolutely brilliant. Another 30% took up to two weeks. So at least half of them had written in those crucial two first weeks. I think after two weeks, things start going wrong in terms of sending out a thank you letter. 25% started to get it wrong. And 5% never even managed to send a thank you letter. But the really bizarre thing, these were, a number of these were council-owned. 20% had to write back and say, hey, you've made the check out to the museum. Unfortunately, we're council-owned, so you're going to have to cancel that and send us another check to the name of the council doesn't make it easy to give. People don't want to write checks to councils. Um, but some other things from this exercise. Only a third included a gift aid form. So two thirds were missing out on 25% money. Only 53% assigned it to a specific gift. We talked about solutions. Even with an unsolicited check, you can attach it to a solution by attaching it to a specific outcome, and giving the donor a sense that their money is achieving something. 20, only 20% 20 wanted to keep in touch with the donor. Only 20%. An unsolicited gift, 50 quid through the door, and 80% said, yeah, fine, whatever. We won't send you anything. We won't let you know what we're doing. 6% um, offered to publicly acknowledge, and 6% went back saying, well, why did you become an annual donor to us? 
Be nice to people. It sounds very simple, but it's amazing how often it doesn't work. Um, the ask. Uh, it, the, the key bit in this, I would say, a good ask needs to be clear, specific, immediate, unambiguous, and easy to follow through with a gift. Um, a few years ago, I was at an event at the Natural History Museum. In the basement of the Natural History Museum, there's a sort of cellar room with tanks full of formaldehyde and fish. And we met the fish man at the Natural History Museum. We were sort of shunted down into groups to meet the fish man. And he took a lid off one of the tanks, and he looked into the tank, <coughs> and he started to explain the story of the fish. And he was one of God's great communicators. After about 10 minutes, we loved him. We, he was showing us a world we had no idea about. And if at the end of that, there'd been someone around the corner saying, the fish man needs another 10 tanks, we're trying to raise money tonight for them, they would have easily surpassed the target. Who are your fish men? Who are the people that are going to be able to communicate about your organization? It could be the artistic director. I've also heard of a, a story of in which a group of um, donors were taken around a theater. They met the guy that lifts the scenery. He needed a machine. By the end of the tour, a donor had written a check for him to buy the machine. Where are your stale scones, and who are your fishmen? Um, having asked, say thank you. Say thank you again and again and again and again and again. Um, Oh, I, I, wish go back one. Uh, I, I was told a story a couple of years ago in Belfast, a huge, great um, uh, capital appeal. Building was about to open. Big donors, big event, all coming together. Man on the stage saying, this really wouldn't have been possible without... And looked at the lady in the audience who'd given the biggest check. And he looked at her and he said, I'm so sorry, I've forgotten your name. <laughs> it happens. If you're not the person saying thank you, make sure the person who is saying thank you has the names. Take them through the pronunciation, take them through everything. Uh, apparently, she just rolled her eyes. Um, and ultimately, this is about relationship development. All good fundraising is about relationship development. Um, all good fundraising is about understanding that it's about them and it's not about you, but it's about relationship development, making them a part of the family, giving them the good news, giving them the bad news, showing them things that the ordinary public don't get to see. That's what really comes down to good donor care. And I would argue, notwithstanding what our Secretary of State says, I would argue that is the core difference between this country and America. It's not the tax breaks, it's not anything else. It's about really good, solid donor care. And there are some great examples of that happening in this country. I was recently talking to some Swedish people, and they said to me that they in Sweden look to this country for knowledge and expertise on cultural fundraising. They see you as experts. If anyone else says you don't know what you're doing, go and look in America, go look at anyone else, don't listen to them. You do know what you're doing. It's just about fine-tuning it and getting it right. Um, uh, ask, and well, all part of relationship development. All of that. Um, I'm going to finish with a quick quote from this piece of research. Um, uh, it, it, God, if you can't sleep, give a read of it. It'll send you to sleep within seconds. Uh, an out-of-date literature review on philanthropy. But at the back of it, there's, I know, it's dreadful. Um, at the back of it, though, there's a really interesting survey of eight cultural philanthropists. Done 10 years ago, but I, all, I, I saw it again the other day. All the quotes still have a very important relevance. And there's one quote in particular I'd like to finish with. This is from an arts patron. I'm sure I have been a friend or a patron along the way and have followed the usual steps in giving more and getting more involved, being brought closer in. But this seemed a natural development, and I didn't feel imposed upon at any point. Sometimes I think this was achieved through professionalism, sometimes exactly the opposite. Sometimes the staff seemed quite amateur, but charming and well-meaning and passionate, and that gets the same result. And if there is one word I have seen time and again around philanthropy, it is passion. This is about finding the astonishing passion that you have for your organizations and going out there and finding people who can share that passion and getting the fire in your eyes to be the fire in their eyes and then making sure there's nothing left in their wallet as they walk away. <laughs> um, it, 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 you've, it's all there. Um, thank you very much for listening. We are now going to have a little exercise and, and there's some sheets in for you. You have to work out what on earth is there any relevance in what I've just said that has any relevance to your organization? But thank you very much for listening to me.